The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting Incorporated, ESPN Kansas City, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros of the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci and Connor Kelly in studio. As always, thank you for joining us. We have a very nice show lined up for you today. You may recall a couple of weeks ago, we discussed the basics of international investing. Today, we're going to go into much more detail on a particular area of international investing, which is emerging markets. Emerging markets are places like China, Brazil, India. These tend to be faster growing markets. And there are some very compelling reasons to consider owning emerging market stocks and bonds in your portfolio. We're going to explain some of those reasons today. We'll look at a few emerging market ETFs, and we'll also talk about recent performance from emerging markets. As part of this discussion, in just a bit, we'll be joined by Kevin Carter, CEO of Big Tree Capital and founder of EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. Kevin will spotlight that ETF, and he'll also offer his perspective on emerging markets right now. Connor, you know, every investor is looking for growth opportunities in their portfolio. I think especially in this market environment we've been in over the past two years, and emerging markets are an area starting to get some more attention now. Nate, they are. I mean, but with the caveat that the performance over the past several years for emerging markets has, has quite frankly been pretty awful. I mean, especially compared to the S and P five hundred. But now, partially because of how beaten up emerging markets have been, they're starting to get some people's attention. But regardless of recent performance, we view emerging markets as as a core part of most investors' portfolios, especially younger and more aggressive investors. And we'll explain the reasons why. Uh, later on in the show. Yeah, and by the way, if you have questions or comments as we talk emerging markets today, you can visit etfstore.com. You can find us on Twitter, or you can email advice at etfstore.com. Well, let's first start by explaining what an emerging market is. These are countries that tend to be developing at a more rapid pace. These are economies that are not nearly as established as places like the U.S. and Japan and in Germany, but they are in the process of moving towards those types of economies. Oftentimes, these emerging market countries are trying to move from more export-oriented economies, especially commodity exports, to consumer-driven economies. In other words, they don't want to be solely dependent on exports to power their local economies. They want a thriving, more affluent population to drive economic growth. And for many investors, the first countries that usually come to mind here are the so-called BRIC countries. BRIC stands for Brazil, Russia, India, and China. But emerging markets also include places like Mexico and Egypt and, and Thailand. MSCI actually classifies 23 countries as emerging markets. And Connor, these countries now contain the large majority of the world's population. And let's let's talk about the consumers, the consumer class or, you know, middle and upper classes that are developing these countries. I mean, what you're seeing, broadly speaking, is people moving from more rural locations into cities and people starting to, you know, desire things like smartphones and all all the trappings of of modern life that we have in the developed world. I mean, nicer food, nicer clothes, everything else. And as these economies develop and incomes grow for a large part of their population, these things become within reach. In, In addition to the consumerism in these countries, you also need to think about the demographic trends behind a lot of these countries. I mean, these countries tend to be much younger and rapidly growing populations, and a younger population can drive workforce and productivity. Kevin Carter, our guest today, has a white paper uh, that he recently released that cites research that by 2025, 
so just nine years from now, the consuming class, consumer class, and emerging markets globally will swell to 4.2 billion people, accounting for $30 trillion annually in spending. I mean, that's nearly half the global total of consumer spending. I mean, those are staggering figures. And and just to put that number in perspective, 4.2 billion people, there's only eh, 350 million people, give or take a few, in the U.S. right now. I mean, 4.2 billion people is a massive, massive growing population in the middle or consumer class in these emerging markets. Yeah, but you know, the interesting thing with emerging markets, I think especially right now, is trying to reconcile these clear opportunities that exist with a poor recent uh, performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because as you touched on, it's been a tough go of it for emerging market investors over the past several years. If you just look at the returns from the most popular emerging market stock ETF, that's the Vanguard FTSE Emerging Markets ETF, ticker VWO, they haven't been pretty. VWO was down 5% in 2013. It was flat in 2014. And then it was down 16% last year. Uh, As a matter of fact, if you look at the price return since 2011, the S&P 500 is up 65%, while VWO is down 28%. And there's no doubt this performance has caused some investors to uh, shy away from emerging markets. Boy, those are... Those are pretty staggering figures when you're talking about the S&P up 65 and, and broad emerging markets down 28 since 2011. I mean, that, that's, that's brutal underperformance. And, you know, there are reasons behind that. You've had slowing growth in China, which is the third lar- largest economy in the world and by far the dominant emerging market economy. You've had the collapse in commodity prices. And why that matters is... Emerging markets are, by and large, huge exporters of commodities around the world. You've had a stronger dollar, which has put additional downward pressure on commodity prices because they are all priced in U.S. dollars. I mean, these have all been significant headwinds facing emerging markets. And as we've discussed plenty of times on the show, the S&P 500 has been the only game in town now for the past three to four years. And by and large, all broad asset classes have underperformed the S&P 500. However, you have to keep the big picture in mind. There will be periods of significant outperformance by emerging markets. We've seen it in the past. I mean, one of my favorite charts ever, and unfortunately we can't, you know, visualize this on our on our radio show, is is the Callan Periodic Table of Investment Returns. It charts the annual performance ranked from best to worst of all major asset classes in equities and fixed income. And if you look at the past 20 years, Emerging market stocks have actually been the best performing asset classes in eight of them. And that would be, you know, for most investors, if you ask them that based on how awful and essentially dead money emerging markets have been for the past four years, that would surprise a lot of investors. But, you know, the the trend of emerging markets not polling their weight will in, will not continue indefinitely. And investors with long-time horizons have to keep that in mind. Well, and so far this year, emerging markets are outpacing the S&P 500. Uh, VWO is up nearly 5%. The S&P 500 is up about 3.5%. And one of the reasons you're hearing a lot more about emerging markets right now, besides the fact that they perform fairly well this year, is that comparatively speaking, they do look more attractively valued than some other areas around the globe. And I don't want to get uh, too technical here, but if you compare metrics like price-to-earnings ratios or price-to-book ratios, emerging market stocks overall look much more attractive than U.S. and developed international stocks. And if you think about it, this makes some sense, simply given the returns we've seen over the past several years. You know, usually in investing, the best time to buy something is after it's been beaten down. Right. And, and while, while valuations don't necessarily tell you the direction of a particular investment in the short term, over longer periods of time, they can tell you a lot about the probabilities of future returns. I mean, you can consider it even along the terms of regression to the mean. I mean, valuations tend to move back to their longer-term historical averages. And right now, emerging markets are significantly below those long-term historical averages. And this year, there have been some positive catalysts for emerging markets. You know, things that were working against them have turned a bit. You know, the falling dollar with the Fed not pushing forward with rate hikes, has helped. 
again, I mean, if the dollar rises, the cost to import goods rises and revenue from export falls. Additionally, it usually causes money to, to leave emerging markets. And then you also have seen the solid recovery, not only in oil, but commodities more broadly speaking. And again, those are massive exports for emerging market economies. Now, it's not all roses. I mean, there are certainly some real concerns in emerging markets. I mean, continued issues with China's economic growth. I mean, their growth has fueled a large part of the demand for commodities globally over the past uh, decade or, or two decades, which, again, come from other emerging markets, things like oil, coal, iron ore, etc. Look at what's going on in Latin America right now, in particular Venezuela and Brazil. I mean, they're both struggling with high inflation, high unemployment, and in Brazil's case, you know, growing social unrest in in, in an attempt to impeach the president. So there's still certainly things to be concerned about within emerging markets. Yeah, there's no doubt there are still some risks here. Uh, And just talking more generally about risk, the fact is when you invest in emerging markets, There is going to be some additional risk. These economies aren't nearly as stable as places like the U.S. They don't have the same regulatory environment. Some of these countries have rather large problems with corruption in both business and and their political systems. And we've seen uh, accounting issues and, and currency devaluations. There are risks here. But on the other hand, you have to consider the upside to investing in emerging markets. We talked about the attractive relative valuations right now. But even putting that aside, emerging markets can offer diversification benefits and longer term growth potential in your portfolio. Interestingly, while emerging markets on their own do tend to be more risky and volatile than U.S. and developed international stocks, adding emerging market stocks to your portfolio can actually lower the overall uh, risk of your portfolio without sacrificing returns because emerging markets don't move in lockstep with U.S. stocks and other investments. And again, you do have that growth potential. We always say there's no free lunch in investing, and that holds true for emerging markets. But for longer-term investors willing to stomach the volatility, emerging markets can offer a wonderful opportunity for your portfolio. And when you think about growth, even with China's slowdown, if you look at the past five years, China and India – are still the fastest growing economies in the world. According to Morningstar, over the past five years, China has had an annual growth of 7.8%, and India is 6.6%. I mean, compare that to here in the U.S., where, you know, we're struggling to achieve GDP growth of, you know, 2 2.5%. We haven't seen 3% in years. So when you boil down the investment thesis for emerging markets, it really comes down to three things. Diversification, attractive valuations right now, and high growth potential. Diversification is the only free lunch in investing, and and we've talked about this. While emerging markets on their own are a more volatile place to invest, like you said, Nate, they can actually lower overall portfolio risk when combined with other equity and fixed income positions. From a fundamental standpoint, emerging emerging markets are, are very attractively valued right now, especially compared to U.S. stocks that enjoyed a a seven-year bull market. At this time, you can, you know, view almost emerging markets like a a value play, a deep value play in in some areas. And finally, the growth potential. Again, emerging markets have younger, growing populations. They have expanding consumer classes or or middle classes. Their economies are less mature than ours in in Western Europe, meaning they have very good odds of, of growing at a much higher rate than the rest of the developed world. So long story short, we view emerging markets as as a key component of of most investors' long-term portfolios, especially those with a longer time horizon or or taking more to a growth, aggressive growth orientation to their allocation. We think investors with the patience to have have stuck with emerging markets through the past couple of years of tough tough performance are are certainly going to be rewarded moving forward. Well, let's take a break here, and when we come back, we'll continue our discussion on emerging markets. Kevin Carter, CEO of Big Tree Capital, will join us. We'll get his thoughts on emerging markets right now, and we'll also spotlight EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. We'll do that right after the break. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 
1-800-227-3837 or visit ETFstore.com. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need, like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. Hi, this is Ryan Wiebe, owner of First Mortgage Solutions. If you've heard news lately about low interest rates and want to know if now is the time to buy a new home or even refinance the one you've got, give one of my experienced loan consultants a call at 816-778-7000. If you're too busy to call right now, just go to firstmortgagekc.com and fill out a full online application. Last year, we saved our average refinance customer over $457 a month on their monthly bills. First Mortgage Solutions, 816-778-7000. The Weeby Group, LLC, Kansas License, MC002-50009, Equal Housing Lender. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentites like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. If you, a family member, or maybe someone you know have been the victim of someone else's negligence, whether due to a motor vehicle collision, an accident at work, a slip and fall, or a product defect, you may be entitled to compensation under the law. The law firm of Van Zanten and Onick is exclusively dedicated to representing victims of negligence in Kansas and Missouri. Please call 816-479-0404 today for a free consultation. Again, 816-479-0404. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertisements. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese and Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million at residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME. Or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nature Racy and Connor Kelly in studio. I'm now pleased to welcome to the program Kevin Carter, CEO of Big Tree Capital and founder of EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. Kevin is joining us via phone today from San Francisco, California. Kevin, a pleasure to have you back on the show. Thanks. Glad to be back. Well, Kevin, I thought we might start today with your general thoughts on emerging markets right now. Uh, If we just look at valuations, I think you could make a fairly compelling case that emerging market stocks, uh, just broadly speaking, appear more attractive than U.S. stocks and developed international stocks. Uh, Do you agree with that? And if so, what do you see as some of the potential drivers here? Well, I do agree with that. The numbers uh, are uh, quite compelling in terms of valuations. Um, Emerging markets have had a, a bad run, really, for the last five years in terms of investment uh, returns. Uh, they've shown a little light uh, this year. But I think there's a structural problem with emerging markets. Uh, if you uh, look at the indexes and the, the largest ETF, uh, for example, the Vanguard Emerging Market ETF, and that problem is state-owned enterprises. Uh, there are about 30% uh, of the uh, indexes are invested in something like Petrobras. Uh, which has been in the headlines uh, quite a bit in the last uh, year. Uh, And they're basically uh, uh, companies that are owned by the government and uh, frequently, uh, if not uh, usually, uh, somewhat corrupt and and not focused on the bottom line and growing profits, which is how you grow value. So I think think they're cheap, but I think there's maybe a reason why a lot of the companies in the indexes should be cheap, because they're not really trying to grow uh, shareholder value. Well, along with that, what do you make of China right now? Uh, there's obviously been a lot of concern over their slowing growth and increasing debt load. Uh, I know there's some concerns with corruption over in China. Are you concerned at all with China, and what about their impact on other emerging market countries? 
Well, I'm certainly not as concerned about it uh, as the headlines would have uh, most Americans be concerned about it. There's obviously problems. Uh, there is slowing growth, but that's, that's really not news. I think, you know, the first uh, thing you learn about China is, uh, at least when I started uh, investing in China a decade ago, is uh, that, you know, the law of large numbers dictates that uh, these growth numbers have to uh, slow down, but a 7% growth is still, uh, you know, the envy of the developed world. So I'm, I'm not concerned about the slowing growth. Uh, the debt, uh, the increase in debt there is perhaps uh, more concerning, but I think they have the tools in place to handle it and a pretty strong balance sheet. So I'm, I'm not as concerned as the headlines would have uh, most people be. Okay, before we talk specifically about your ETF, why should the average investor consider owning emerging market stocks in their portfolio? At just high level, and maybe if we put valuations aside, how should investors think about emerging market stocks? Well, I think investors should certainly own emerging markets, uh, you know, diversification. Uh, you know, 85% of the world's population lives in these uh, markets. Uh, 88% of the uh, young people, people under 30, so you know, nearly 90% of the world's uh, youth uh, live in these countries, and uh, they're going to continue to grow. They're going to grow faster in the United States and develop markets, and I think it's definitely a place where uh, investors should be investing. I just think they have to be very selective in how they invest there, and I think the broad uh, index ETFs may not be the best way to go. Again, we're visiting with Kevin Carter, CEO of Big Tree Capital and founder of EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. Uh, well, Kevin, let's talk about that ETF. The ticker symbol is EMQQ. This owns the stocks of over 40 leading Internet and e-commerce companies operating in emerging markets. Uh, explain to us the goal of this ETF. Well, the goal is to give investors exposure to what I believe is the greatest growth story of our lifetime. And let me uh, tell you why I think that. One of the things that you learn pretty quick when you study emerging markets is that the, the real growth story is the story of the consumer. Uh, again, you have billions of people that are moving on up and joining uh, the consumption class. And as they do that, uh, as they move up the, the income uh, strata, uh, they buy more things. They buy shoes. They buy uh, appliances. They buy televisions. And eventually, perhaps, they even buy an automobile. And and that is uh, a story that McKinsey uh, and company calls the greatest growth opportunity in the history of capitalism. But just as the smartphone is changing our consumption patterns, uh, the smartphone is crashing into this consumer wave, and the results are, I believe, uh, some of the most astonishing uh, growth rates uh, that will exist in my lifetime. Of the, uh, the companies in the uh, ETF are growing uh, at close to 40% top line, so revenue growth of, of a, about 40%. And that's, that's been the pace for five years, and that's hard to do. I can only think of one U.S. company growing at that rate, but this is a, a combination of 40-plus uh, companies, uh, most of which live uh, here on our exchanges. Well, Kevin, can you give us an idea as to some of the top holdings in this ETF that uh, maybe our listeners might be familiar with? Sure. Well, uh, most people are familiar with Alibaba. Uh, Alibaba, the large Chinese uh, e-commerce uh, leader, uh, which, by the way, just announced uh, guidance uh, for 48% revenue growth for the uh, current fiscal year. Uh, that's obviously one many uh, people know about. Uh, there's another uh, company that's one of the largers called Tencent which might not be as well-known to U.S. investors. It trades in Hong Kong, uh, and it uh, has uh, become one of the largest companies uh, in the uh, index. Um, but there's other companies. There's uh, uh, Wuba, 58.com, which trades on the New York Stock Exchange. This is uh, basically the Craigslist of China, um, and uh, uh, really a fantastic business. And literally there's, there's not only uh, 45 companies uh, publicly traded that are in the ETF, but those companies themselves uh, have dozens and dozens of investments in private companies. Many uh, of your listeners may have seen that Apple uh, recently invested a billion dollars in the leading Chinese uh, taxi-hailing app, Didi, uh, which competes with Uber. Didi is, in fact, uh, so private, um, but uh, is owned by Alibaba and Tencent, uh, at least uh, partially. So... Um, there's a lot of companies people would recognize, but there's also a lot that people wouldn't recognize. Uh, they may uh, become more and more familiar as more of these IPO in the United States. 
Kevin, how are the holdings in EMQQ selected? What's the basic process here? Well, it's, it's a straightforward rules-based index. So every company that's publicly traded in the world that gets more than half of its revenue from uh, Internet-related activities in the developing world, uh, they're included as long as they have a market value of over $300 million. Uh, It's market cap-weighted, and it's rebalanced uh, semi-annually in June and December. You know, I think one of the interesting aspects to the companies included in EMQQ is that many are backed by U.S. venture capital firms. And so you can make the case that these companies are are much more scrutinized from a corporate governance perspective than typical state-owned enterprises, as you touched on earlier. Can you maybe talk about that? Well, I I certainly can, and I think that's very important for investors to understand. Um, Again, the, the one of the real challenges in uh, the emerging markets is governance, and it's not just the state-owned enterprises, which are clearly uh, conflicted. Um, uh, so these companies, what's happening is these companies are generally started by uh, local entrepreneurs, most of whom come and have gone to uh, our leading universities, and they end up getting funded by Silicon Valley venture capital investors, uh, usually with Ivy League money, and because of that, uh, the governance is, is usually quite good from the beginning, and they choose to list on our exchanges because we have the, the highest listing standards and the most transparency. And so in an area where uh, governance is uh, oftentimes questionable, I think you can definitely make the case that, that this group of companies uh, has the best corporate governance uh, in the developing world. Kevin, going back to the holdings, you mentioned one of the top holdings in the CTF is Alibaba. Can you explain how a company like Alibaba sort of captures the overall opportunity for investors with a CTF, just in terms of actually getting exposure to a company like Alibaba? Because that's not always easy to do through traditional indexes. Well, you're right. Um, and this is one of the things that has bothered me for quite some time. I remember when I first got involved with China a decade ago and asked, to see a list of all the companies in the China index, and I got to the bottom of the list, and I didn't see Baidu, and I asked, where is Baidu? And the index people said, well, we don't include Baidu because it trades in the United States. And, and that's changed a little bit, but it, it hasn't changed in the largest ETF. The Vanguard Emerging Market Fund doesn't own Alibaba, uh, and it doesn't own really any of these companies. Meanwhile, it owns Petrobras, four different places. It owns the preferred stock, the local listing, the ADR, and the electrical subsidiary. So I think that the indexes are essentially punishing these companies because they choose to list uh, in the United States, which is better for investors. So it's, uh, I think, a real problem. Again, we're visiting with Kevin Carter, CEO of Big Tree Capital and founder of EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. Uh, Kevin, where does this ETF fit in an investor's portfolio? Well, I think it, it fits in any investor who's looking for long-term growth, uh, their portfolio. Um, I think, but just look at what the Internet has done here. Uh, my wife uh, used to go to Target five times a week, uh, and now she goes maybe once a month, but every single day uh, a truck comes over the hill and leaves the box on our front porch. So uh, I think that you know, if you're looking for growth, it's hard for me to imagine – uh, an area that's going to grow uh, the way uh, the Internet is uh, in the developing world. So I, I think it, it, it belongs in growth portfolios, and it certainly should be part of any uh, emerging market allocation, because if you're using the largest uh, emerging market ETF, the Vanguard ETF, you're not getting exposure to this, uh, I think, exciting sector. All right, we have uh, just a couple of minutes left here. I'm curious, moving forward, where do you see innovation occurring in, in emerging market ETFs? Obviously, EMQQ, I think that's a very innovative concept uh, to, to invest in emerging markets, as I'm sure you're intimately familiar with. We've seen all sorts of, uh, quote-unquote, smart beta products launch that cover emerging markets. I'm just curious, moving forward, where do you see the innovation occurring with emerging market ETFs? Well, I, I, first of all, I would say right now, if, if uh, you know, investors want to get exposure to the real growth of emerging markets, it's captured in EMQQ and, and then perhaps also in Econ, which is an emerging market consumer ETF, which owns the more traditional, you know, beer and, and food companies. Um, you know, I have to be honest, I, I'm still concerned about the makeup of the indexes and this, you know, huge portion of, of state-owned enterprises. So even if you 
you know, weight the companies differently using so-called smart beta techniques, you still uh, are including, uh, you know, a huge part of your portfolio in companies that really aren't trying to grow value. And I think that's a structural problem. I, I guess uh, if uh, there was one thing I would like to see happen, and perhaps uh, I will uh, endeavor to put it together, an index that's more like the S&P 500 where the companies are selected uh, after some screening. And, you know, the problem with uh, the sort of traditional indexing that's taken over is they include every company. So the Russell 1000, for example, in the U.S. owns the 1,000 largest companies. The S&P 500, however, is actually selected uh, by a committee, uh, not, you know, in a traditional buy-sell uh, type of approach, but, but with a, some element of screening for quality. I, I'd like to see uh, an ETF come to market that, that – uh, does something like the S&P 500 does here in the United States. Do you think it will take some sort of catalyst to uh, have some of these state-owned enterprises maybe minimized or removed from the traditional indexes? And I, I guess along with that, I'm also curious as to your thoughts. Right now, MSCI, uh, I think today, is is contemplating whether or not to add China A shares uh, to, to the index. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, yes. Let me uh, let me speak about the China A share market. I think, I, first of all, I don't think it will happen. I, I know uh, that the decision is uh, uh, forthcoming, but there's some real structural challenges to uh, the A share market, which is basically that they are not always viable and sellable. There's, they've become easier to access uh, through some you know continued reforms to the market, but there remains the risk that the uh, access to buy or sell shares uh, can get shut off. And it's hard to have uh, an, an ETF, uh, for an ETF that's holding that it may not be able to buy or sell when the time comes. So I believe the Vanguard people have started to add A shares, and I, I believe uh, regret it a little bit. But I think the problem remains that the China A share market uh, is full of really the second tier state owned enterprises. So uh, while you know, China Mobile and the Bank of China uh, and the larger uh, state-owned companies have traded in Hong Kong and thus been included. Uh, the China Asia market is really just more of the same. There's really not uh, a whole lot of entrepreneurial companies in that market. So I, I think it's a market to largely be avoided. Well, Kevin, we'll have to leave it there. As always, excellent perspective on emerging markets. We certainly appreciate you joining us on the program today. Sure. Thanks a lot, guys. That was Kevin Carter, founder of Big Tree Capital. The ETF is EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. And you can learn more about that ETF by visiting emqqetf.com. That's emqqetf.com. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll wrap up our discussion on emerging markets, and we'll also have a quick market update. You're listening to the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own, human, who you are, and intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder, plans for life, architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Business disputes are rarely just about money. Oftentimes, they involve a breach of trust or a fundamental disagreement about the terms or operation of the business. The law firm of Graves Garrett offers comprehensive and creative solutions to these types of complex legal problems. Graves Garrett represents businesses and individuals nationwide in commercial litigation, white-collar criminal defense litigation, and compliance and internal investigations. If you're involved in a critical legal dispute, let Graves Garrett be your voice. Visit GravesGarrett.com or call 816-256-3181. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements. We're always on the hunt for game changers. The iPhone, Uber, Airbnb. 
all revolutionary market leaders. In the financial world, the exchange-traded fund is the game changer, growing at a record pace by cutting the cost of mutual funds and helping you keep what you've worked so hard to earn. At the ETF store, we utilize the latest technology to help you create a balanced portfolio you can monitor and, most importantly, understand. Call us today for a free consultation, 816-363-ETFS, or go to ETFstore.com. This segment is brought to you by the Bushnell Factory Outlets, offering big savings on a variety of brands such as Primos, Tasco, Hoppies, Bole, and more. Stop by either of our stores located in Lenexa, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, and let our expert sales associates help you with your purchases. The Bushnell Factory Outlet Stores serve as your destination to purchase the most extensive assortment of Bushnell brand of products anywhere in the United States. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor in studio. Hope you enjoyed our conversation with Kevin Carter on Emerging Markets and EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. Uh, you know, Connor, I thought Kevin had some interesting points on emerging markets, uh, especially with the state-owned enterprises. And he makes a compelling case for investing in an area of emerging markets like Internet and, and E-Commerce companies. He really did. It, it, it's a theme that continues from last week. We We had... Um, Christian Magoon on to discuss their recently launched Amplify Online Retail ETF, which is a U.S.-based e-commerce ETF. And and Christian did a great job describing the, the shift from traditional brick-and-mortar retailers to online retail, the, the what he called the move from bricks to, to clicks. And, and now we have this ETF with EMQQ um, focusing again on online retail and more broadly e-commerce, but with the focus on emerging markets. So if you believe in the growth trend of emerging markets as a whole and also the continued shift towards online commerce, then this ETF fits both of those long-term trends. So, Nate, bear with me for a second because I want to go off on a tangent here because I think this this is a really fascinating part of emerging market investments here. Here's, here's what's interesting about emerging markets. Obviously, very few people in emerging markets globally own cars. And compare that to the U.S., where we drive everywhere to do everything. Most of the developing world doesn't have that option. I mean, we're, we're talking about people getting around on bikes, scooters, you know, public transportation if they're lucky. With the advance of, of e-commerce in many countries, the whole traditional brick-and-mortar retail space has essentially just been skipped over, where their consumer class has grown up and matured almost strictly online. And it reminds me of, of a 60-minute story from, from several months ago, I think it was in the fall, where they discussed how advanced a mobile pay, mobile banking system was in, in Kenya, uh, obviously a, a country located in Africa. And with the fact that how remote these villages were and the lack of access to transportation, the country's entire banking system was almost entirely mobile phone-based. And it, it blew my mind that this relatively poor African country was more, you know, technologically advanced than us in the U.S. in this particular part of, of online banking. And, you know, I, I think it it, it kind of confirms an underlying theme of these emerging markets that they're just skipping parts of the development of their consumer class with, with old school retail strip malls and large stores that was a part of it here in the U.S. And, you know, they're all essentially going straight to e-commerce, to buying everything online as, as a consumer class. So, you know, an argument can be made that there there could be more potential for growth in this e-commerce uh, market in these emerging markets than even here in the U.S. I, I think that's a great point. And, you know, I would also go back to something that you touched on earlier, and I believe Kevin mentioned, which is just the younger demographics of these emerging market populations. You, you know, it's funny, when we had Christian Magoon on the show last week, you asked him a question about uh, millennials and, you know, millennials driving that that move. You know, I think Christian said clicks over bricks. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the demographics of emerging markets, because it is a younger population, to your point, they're growing up with this technology, but they're also much more comfortable using 
this technology. And so you, you have a situation where you're right that this technology has sort of, uh, uh, you know, evolved in, in some of the development that, that maybe the U.S. went through. Emerging markets are just skipping over. But you have a younger population that's entirely comfortable using that technology. Right, right. Our, you know, our conversation from last week with Christian, I, 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 I'm, I recall him saying that in the U.S., even though we've had this phenomenal growth of online retail, there is still a lot of upside because 7% of total consumer shopping is online. So still a ton more to go in the U.S. A lot of people still, especially older population, still go to the store, right? But when you look at these emerging markets, they just skip that part. And when you look at the demographic numbers, um, you know, what we mentioned earlier was, you know, the, the white paper that Kevin put out that there could be 4.2 billion people in this emerging market consumer class in the next nine to 10 years. And then the fact that, you know, fascinating stat that Kevin mentioned in our interview that 88% of the entire world's population that is under age 30 are located in emerging and frontier markets. I mean, just massive demographic trends moving in the right direction for emerging markets. And the argument can be made, in particular, e-commerce. Yeah, in any event, certainly an interesting conversation with Kevin. Uh, I, I think it's clear he knows emerging markets uh, extremely well and a compelling ETF with EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF. And we have just a few minutes uh, before break here uh, because I do want to make sure to get to our market update. But while we're talking emerging markets, I, I did want to mention a great article Bloomberg ran last week. It was titled, A BlackRock Bond ETF Heralds New World Order in Emerging Markets. And it laid out how the iShares Emerging Markets bond ETF, ticker symbol EMB, it recently became the biggest emerging market debt fund, bigger than any emerging market debt mutual fund. And now for the first time, ETFs are the most popular options for both stock and bonds or stocks and bonds in emerging markets. The article says, uh, and I quote, ETFs have steadily overtaken traditional funds in almost every major market. And they mentioned the iShares Emerging Markets Stock ETF and Vanguard's Emerging Markets ETF. Of course, both of those are index-based uh, ETFs. And really, the point of the article was that when you think about an area where active mutual fund managers might perform well, you would think that would be emerging markets because maybe they could find some diamonds in the rough and lean on their research and, and analytics. But as it turns out, that's not the case. Bloomberg said, uh, and again, I quote, in reality, Active managers worldwide are struggling to beat their benchmarks. And, Connor, I just think with the options we now have with ETFs, whether you want to invest broadly or, or more narrowly, like the ETF we just highlighted with Kevin, it's tough to pay for expensive, underperforming mutual funds, whether we're talking uh, the U.S. or emerging markets. Well, that's the catch is the expense part, because broadly speaking, emerging market stock mutual funds are the most expensive sector to invest in and in, in actively manage funds. And the same can be said in fixed income. Emerging market fixed income funds are usually the most expensive actively managed funds. So th the reality is that, again, while it's touted that this would be a perfect space for, you know, active managers, to, to your point, find those diamonds in the rough and, and, and you know, dig through maybe a, a more opaque market that not a lot of people know about, the reality is that's not, that's not the case. Um, looking over the past five years... 94% of emerging market fixed income funds or bond funds miss their benchmark, 94%, because their fees are so high and it is so difficult for active managers to actually produce that outperformance and go over to the, get over that hurdle on an annual basis of their high fees. And you're seeing the results of this underperformance in the fund flows, with ETFs now officially being the largest fund in both emerging market stocks and bonds. Yeah, and I don't think that's a, a trend that's going to slow down anytime soon. And I again, I just come back to when, when you when you hear uh, proponents of active management, you know, they will talk about finding uh, outperformance in, in quote unquote inefficient markets mm -hmm. or less efficient markets. Sometimes they'll point to smaller cap U.S. stocks or in this case emerging market stocks. And the fact is, w whatever data you look at, the vast majority underperform in, in those markets, and and that's what we've seen here. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll have our weekly market update. This is the ETF Store Show. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store investment advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 
888-382-3837 or visit ETFstore.com. Do stains in your carpet keep coming back and now you're stressing over the high cost to replace it? Then you need to call Zero Res. Their carpet cleaning process does not use soaps or toxic chemicals, which all leave behind residues that attract more dirt immediately. This Zero Residue technology will not only have your carpets looking great, it also extends the life of your carpet. Check them out online at ZeroResKC.com or call 816-425-3655 and schedule your cleaning today. Do you want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need j Media. j Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. j Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out j today. It's a fact that most any day can be a special day for someone. A birthday, an engagement, an anniversary, a promotion, or an I love you day. It's also a fact that Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry offers hundreds of ways to say love or thanks or congrats or I'm so happy you're in my life. So when you want to make your special day extra special, think Lichtenberg's Fine Jewelry, 131st in State Line, 816-941-2221. For those of you who haven't heard, the oldest building in Kansas City has the newest rooftop deck. Kelly's Westport Inn's rooftop deck has a full-service bar, TVs, bathrooms, lots of fans, and an awesome view of Westport. Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. The U.S. economy is often referred to as a competitive marketplace, yet many Americans don't understand the parameters of this competition. Why is it that so many people don't understand a subject that is so important to their daily lives? The simple answer is nobody ever taught them. The Missouri Council on Economic Education exists in order to right this wrong by promoting economic and financial education in Missouri. To learn more about our efforts and to get involved, please visit missouri.councilforeconed.org. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor in studio. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Stocks began the week fairly strongly last week, but faltered on Friday. The S&P 500 ended the week down a tenth of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up a third of a percent. And the Nasdaq was down a little over one percent for the week. Connor, the S&P 500 actually came awfully close to hitting a new all-time record high last week. But as I mentioned, stocks then cratered a a bit on Friday. And it seemed like all of the things that we talked about on the show last week uh, were weighing on the markets Friday. Uh, The Brexit, oil, uh, this week's Fed meeting. And, you know, the markets are always uncertain. But it feels like investors are really struggling for direction right now. I would say uncertainty seems to be at an all-time high. Nate, this is such an odd environment to get your arms around. Let me give you the most clear example in my mind. You have the S&P 500, you know, almost near new all-time highs. I mean, obviously, a pullback on Friday into the start of this week, but still within shouting distance of all-time highs achieved last year. But then you have the 10-year Treasury yield plummeting. I mean, as of this morning, it was down to 1.59%, which is just a massive move in yields and what that means is there's so much demand for bonds these you know the 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 
the safety play of the flight to safety in 10-year treasuries, that yields have continued to drop. As, as demand for more people buying bonds, the, yields, the yield goes down naturally. This is a very unique situation to have bonds performing in this manner with stocks still at these elevated levels. Normally, you, you usually see kind of one or the other. The, the interest rate policies of central banks have distorted most historical valuation metrics. I mean, when money's free, it makes it hard to price other risky assets. And that's what we're seeing the market struggle with right now. There's really this feeling that the Fed and, and other central banks aren't going to be able to unwind these massive stimulus programs. I mean, negative rates are everywhere. Rates still in the U.S. are historically low. And, and while these central bankers claim to know everything, nobody knows how this is going to play out because we've never seen these types of actions in terms of monetary policy or this type of scale in the years of, of, pre, of free money and negative rates and low rates. And the reality is nobody knows how this is going to play out. Well, and, you know, I think that's why we've seen gold perform so well this year. Let's talk about gold. The iShares Gold Trust is now up 20% this year. Gold itself is approaching $1,300 an ounce. Uh, we saw George Soros come out last week. He's the famed investor. He manages some $30 billion dollars. He said he was selling stocks and buying gold and gold miners. Uh, he's concerned with the overall global economy. Other prominent investors are also bullish on gold. Jeff Gunlock predicted gold would go to $1,400 an ounce. Uh, as we've always said, gold performs well when there's uncertainty, uh, when there's concern about the value of other assets, and that's what we have right now. Look, first of all, you need to take predictions with the, with the grain of salt. We discussed this at length a couple of shows ago. But... Soros and Gunlock are, are names that get your attention, without a doubt. And for many investors, when you're nervous about stocks and even the bond market, a lot of investors see gold as that answer, that, that, that you know, store of value in times of crisis. And in addition to that, you know, we, we, we see two other current bullish tailwinds for gold. The first is the, the low slash negative interest rate opportunity, you know, reality across most of the globe. And what that means is the opportunity cost to own gold is is reduced or eliminated. And 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 why that's important is the the the, the people that have historically um, viewed gold as a is not a, a valid investment always complain that it doesn't pay you to own it, right? It doesn't pay you dividends, it doesn't pay you bond interest, but in a market environment where dividend yields are decreasing and bond interest is almost zero and negative in some parts of the world, that eliminates that um, opportunity cost for owning gold. The second is clearly the growing concern around the globe about a Brexit and how much that would weaken the EU and the euro specifically as a currency. I mean, it's going to be a couple of fascinating weeks in Europe as we head towards this vote next week and through really the end of the month uh, here in June. But, you know, if you were to sum this up, if you look at just the three broad asset classes in terms of stocks, bonds, and cash, okay, you know, there's a lot of talk about stocks being overvalued or, or certainly on the upper end of evaluation. Certainly so, in the U.S. Right. And so a lot of investors don't feel good about being in U.S. stocks. You look at uh, bonds, as you mentioned, you have yields coming down and, and, and getting close to, to historical lows again. And, of course, bond prices and interest rates move inversely. And so there's concern that, you know, how much lower can we go? Now, hey, maybe we can go lower. We have negative rates around the world. There's $10 trillion uh, of, of, of negative uh, yielding bonds around the world. But, you know, as a bond investor, at some point you go, if rates start ticking up, I'm going to lose uh, principal That's on the right. bonds. And they're not paying anything. And then, again, you have cash, which isn't paying anything. It's not yielding anything sitting in your bank account or in a money market. And so you can see why investors are naturally gravitating to gold. Yeah, Nate, that's a great summary because, again, you can see major issues with the other large asset classes, you know, that that are out there for you as an investor. Now, obviously, we just spent the entire show talking about emerging markets and how there's you know, real attractive valuations right now. But, you know, that's a long-term investment for, you know, investors with a growth to aggressive growth mentality to be in emerging markets. And, you know, certainly the, the, the current valuations here in the U.S. 
are giving a lot of investors pause, at least over the short term. Well, and we're about out of time, but what I would say about emerging markets, that's a good reason why you want to be diversified in this environment. You want to own U.S. stocks. You want to own international stocks. You want to own some bonds, uh, some cash, and, and maybe some gold. The key here is stay diversified. All right, we'll have to leave it there as we are out of time for today's show. I want to thank Kevin Carter, founder of EMQQ, the Emerging Markets Internet and E-Commerce ETF, for joining us on the program today. And just a reminder that all of our guest interviews are available at our ETF Expert Corner at ETFstore.com. Full podcasts of the ETF Store show are also available at ETFstore.com along with Apple iTunes and Google Play. Next week, be sure to join us for the best of the ETF Store Show. That'll be next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Until then, have a great week, everyone.